for the effects in the film, we wanted a, a comfort level of, of working with people that we'd worked with before. So we immediately wanted to use Bob and Dennis Gotak. Jim Cameron approached us. Um, we were working at a visual effects company at the time, and uh, we had worked together on uh, some of the Roger Corman movies, uh, which is where we first met, Battle Beyond the Stars and Galaxy of Terror. Jim was interested in the fact that we were artists. Both Dennis and I could draw storyboards or sketch out sets and work in that kind of organic way and develop the sequences as we went along. That was, I think, something that he was looking for, an ability to design. Thing, so he could hand off sequences, give us an idea of what he wanted, and we could develop it further, go to him for approval, and then we could shoot it. Prior to going to England, we uh, had a need to shoot the, uh, some of the derelict sequences for uh, process plates. Um, and uh, so uh, it turned out that a friend of ours, Bob Burns, had the um, a derelict ship from the original film, which was in really rough shape. I mean, I was cutting pieces and the, the, the clay that was on the, on the surface had, had fallen off. So we, uh, we wound up refurbishing that model and building miniature uh, in the States. And we photographed that again before we left uh, for England. As a matter of fact, I think we got the last of some of the still plates that we needed were shot on the very night, 3 a.m. I think we finished two hours sleep, hopped on a plane and went to England. At one point, we had uh, two full sound stages for the miniatures, and because we were now, you're now looking at a fairly vast area that encompassed the uh, the colony complex. That was a fifth scale miniature, so the buildings were about average, you know, five to eight feet tall, and it was about 30, 40 feet long. The atmosphere processing station was a sort of conical shaped structure and I, I forgot it's like 600 feet tall with some immense thing tall i think we had a, a four wall site which is a cyclorama with basically a painting of the uh the planet of uh this sort of ominous dark sky for the background and this would be for the shots of the atmosphere processing station and uh for the colony complex at the time pinewood stood in way out in the the back sort of open area, they'd had standing sets for uh, all kinds of movies like Supergirl. And, but because the weather is so harsh there, it just destroys the sets. And, they, and pretty much they'll build a set and then they'll tear it down. But the tarmac is still there in the streets. And there was always sort of this internal little fire out there where they were burning pieces of sets and so forth. And there's all kinds of junk out there. So Bob and I went out there one day with a wheelbarrow. And we just picked all this stuff up. And in the colony, all the, a lot of the dressing that is in the colony complex is a lot of this debris that was out in this sort of a junkyard of, a, of a burning stuff. And it was great because it had been, it had been burnt and it had rusted and it looked really authentic. And we didn't have to make it. It was just right, right there. We could just bring it in. Jim's idea was that on one side of town were these modules that were flown in and set down. These were all the office buildings and what have you were most of the action takes place in the movie and the other side of the street was what we call the bad part of town it was you know like a, a bar and the little restaurants and things that were set up uh, they were built let's say out of giant shipping containers that once you empty these containers you had a building back then there were these huge rolling doors that had a lot of rust because it rains a lot right and uh, it just had a very specific look so we were walking along and Jim goes oh this this rust is what I on this thing so I would take a picture of that. and we found a lot of reference actually at Pinewood because at the time it was sort of uh, it was going to hell and I could tell the model makers well just go outside it was actually the door to the model shop that he you know, so I said well, here's the rust right here just do this weather played a key part in the atmosphere of Asheron so when it was uh, when we had to have rain and wind and all of that happening, interacting, that adds a layer on top of everything else that really made it difficult to to control. 
we would do something, we would hopefully get it in the first try in, the, in one day, but fairly often because of the nature of these things, it was not possible to do it. Now, none of this is earth shatteringly difficult in and of itself, but the combinations together would just made it excruciatingly difficult at times. The budget wasn't a huge budget by any means for that type of film at the time. Jim was going to use visual effects to extend sets and just give a, you know, a larger scope to the picture in general. Uh, using rear projection, uh, using mirror shots, beam splitters, uh, in-camera splits, foreground miniatures, you name it, anything that we could get away with in-camera. The reason for the miniature at the um, uh, atmosphere processor, which was the Acton location, is um, there were limitations on what live action uh, art department could deliver, and Jim wanted to see this encrustation, the alien sort of cocoon extending up and intertwined on the ceiling and it seemed to be the only way to do that was with with a miniature it could have been handled as an insert say a character looks up and sees it but we decided that we wanted to do it as a as a tilt down actually you know look up at it and then have the camera come down and see the actors in the shot so um uh, the way that was created was um you know, the miniature uh, some of the miniature people went over to act in we went over with a camera we paced out where the miniature would go and we figured out the size for it and we took reference photos and um, built the miniature back at Pinewood Studios based on those measurements. It pretty much had to be sculpted in place with a camera there. So the sculptors could see through the cameras they sculpted. This is the only way to do this type of shot. If this is the camera, the set's way back here. Right in front of the camera up here is a miniature that actually blends to the background. So because you're only th looking through one little lens, a single lens, you don't have binocular vision, you have one eye. When you look through the lens, this foreground miniature would match up with the full-size set, you know, 30 or 40 feet away. As it turned out, that was shot on the very first day of principal photography, and it was one of the first shots up, if not the first shot. And uh, so we knew that it would be looked at by um, people at, at 20th Century Fox. So we wanted to make a really terrific shot. And you could imagine my surprise after we had set this miniature up. And we had all the actors out there. And I think David Geiler was sitting on a ladder behind the set. But Jim turned to me and said, well, it's your shot. You direct it. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was terrific. <laughs> so I actually got to direct that, that uh, shot in the film. The actors that were in the foreground, uh, their lights that were on their uh, mounted on their shoulders were in fact interacting with the light across the top part of our miniature and then had to blend to the bottom. So we had somebody off camera moving a light around in sync with their action. So all of those things worked out together and frankly, it all worked. Part of the shot started with James Remar right up in camera on this, on this uh, foreground miniature shot. And um, he turns away and walks away. So it's, and now it's a different actor. Now it's Michael Bean. And they had actually, uh, because this had happened after we'd shot this, the miniature was trashed. It was, uh, it, it came back <laughs> in the truck. It was styrofoam, it was delicate and so forth. And we thought we were all done, everybody was happy. And then Remar left. And uh, Jim was saying, oh, we're going to have to reshoot this. And I was like, oh, I'll put this all back together because it was just, it, it was very difficult to do this. So um, luckily he picked up the shot just as the other actor turned away. So it worked out, but it was, whoo.